Hey, good morning, every nation, New Jersey. God bless you. Thank you again for joining us here on another Sunday morning. And um, I hope you have your, your cup of joe and you have your Bible ready to go because I'm going to talk to you about something that I believe you'll start seeing and hearing all around you uh, during this Christmas season. I want to talk to you about joy. Um, now, joy, we're going to hear about joy to the world, and we're going to see Christmas decorations with the word joy all plastered on it. Uh, but I wonder, do you know what the Bible means when it talks about joy? I think for many of us, we would think uh, when we hear the word joy, we think happiness. And you wouldn't be wrong if you thought that. That's very much a part of joy. But joy is much more robust uh, than happiness. See, happiness has to do with our circumstances or our happenings. It's external to us. And therefore, happiness is very fragile and very fleeting. Uh, for example, your life could be going amazing until suddenly a microscopic virus uh, that you, you can't even see with the naked eye can shatter uh, the happiness you have in your life. And so um, what I want to talk to you this morning about is joy. And joy is this a deep and abiding satisfaction rooted in God. A deep and abiding satisfaction rooted in God. It becomes unshakable. Therefore, when, when happiness is nowhere to be found, we can still walk in a deep abiding joy. And so that's what I want to discuss with you. But before we do that, I, I have to take up our, our tithes and the offerings. And if you, I just ask that you'd excuse me. I'd like to take a little bit longer uh, this morning, um, because I, I want to make a, a quasi announcement here. And, and so, uh, uh, the, normally this is the time where we take up the tithe and the tithe, it just simply means a tenth that we believe here at every nation, New Jersey, that the first tenth of all of our increase, it belongs to Jesus and we give it to him, uh, in the tithe. Um, but as well, we also know that there's the thing that the, that the Bible refers to as an offering. And that's over and above the tithe. And usually every year at the end of the year, uh, every nation, New Jersey, we want to make a difference in the world. And so we take up a special offering that we might have impact uh, to, to truly help a hurting and sin sick world. And so uh, last year, if you recall, and it seems like a decade ago, but we did what was called the Big Give. And, uh, and you did just that. You gave big that uh, every nation, New Jersey, we raised $47,000 and we were able to make a difference in the world. Like if you remember what we did, we took a, we actually were able to have a portion, uh, a book of the Bible translated uh, into a, the native tongue of a third world country. Um, like what would you pay to, to actually for the first time have the word of God in your hands. Uh, then as well, we, we took a portion uh, of the, the big give and we, we actually dug a well in Pakistan. Um, and really that is a great church planting, um, really, uh, method whereby we, we, we pay to have a well dug and then church, uh, planters go in and they talk about Jesus who called himself living water. And then lastly, if you remember, we took several thousands of dollars and we gave to two organizations. One was Family Promise, a home, homeless shelter right here uh, in Morris Plains, New Jersey. And as well, we gave to New City Kids uh, several thousands of dollars. Uh, we gave to them uh, because what they're doing is they're helping end generational poverty. And uh, many of the, the uh, young men and young women uh, that, that go through the New City Kids program are young men and women of color. And what a great opportunity that we could uh, make an impact towards all the racial uh, injustice and things that are going on in our world. And so I was so proud of you as a church that all we were able to do by your generous giving. But can we agree that things are a little bit different a year later? And um, this year, after some time in prayer, I, I'm, I'm convinced of this fact. Uh, wh whatever our surroundings or the economy or anything like that, God calls his people to generously give because we've been given to by God Almighty. But listen, I think this year, uh, last year we were able to get, have a big give. This year, I want to lean into the reality that we serve a big God. I'm not sure if you, you know this here, Bible trivia. Do you know that the only uh, miracle that Jesus performed that's in all four gospels, 
Do, 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 do. It is Jesus feeding the 5,000. Um, that, that was only 5,000 men. Uh, many theologians believe it was probably upwards of 20,000 people. And do you remember what Jesus used to, to feed 20,000 people? He took a little boy's uh, five loaves and two fishes. Like a small offering, Jesus was able to multiply it and do something ma- amazing and powerful. And that's what I'm calling us to uh, as a church. Uh, we're going to do what we just call multiply. Um, Jesus took some loaves and fish. He multiplied them, gave thanks, and was able to satisfy and to, to perform a miracle. And I believe that as we're faithful to take the loaves and the fish that God gives to us, whatever small thing that we can give, that God's able to take it and he's able to multiply it and do something amazing. And so uh, uh, while last year was the big give, this year I trust that we serve a, a big God. And he's going to take our loaves and fish, whatever we can afford to give uh, unto God, that, that God's going to do something great and he's going to help people through it. And so this year uh, we're going to be giving once again to, to New City Kids. Uh, half of the proceeds is going to go to New City Kids. See, we want to multiply the impact they're having. Uh, th- throughout this past year, we've heard so much uh, about racial and uh, financial inequality. And now what we're seeing, see, it's one thing to talk about it. New City Kids is doing something about it. And they're, they're changing, actually, the lives of generations. And so we want to help multiply their efforts. And so half of all the proceeds that come in in our multi- multiply giving campaign will go to New City Kids. The other half is going to go right here to Every Nation New Jersey because we want to multiply our online uh, presence. Uh, with, with COVID and, and now uh, we see the church has grown in its presence online. The gospel, suddenly there's places that had never gone before in homes that had never gone before and now we're able to go there. Uh, but we need, uh, in order to multiply our efforts, uh, we need to raise some funds that we can do this in a more excellent way. This video you're watching right now is on my phone. It's about six years old. Uh, and I'm praying that the battery doesn't die before our broadcast is over. All right. And so uh, we want to multiply our church's efforts uh, in order to bring the gospel uh, to every nation, tribe and tongue. And so and then here's the last thing we want to multiply. And then then I'll pray. We want to we want God to multiply your seed. See that there's a promise that God says as you give to him and you give to others that God promises that he will multiply the seed that he puts in your hand, that you might be a generous sower. I'll read it to you. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, uh, we read it says this, that he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. And so, Father, I pray that you'd uh, just be with us, uh, Lord, both in the tithe and the offering, and Lord, those as we as we get behind, I pray, Lord, that you would take the simple offering, the loaves and the fish that we send to you, uh, Lord, and that you would multiply and do a miracle through it in Jesus' name. As always, there's uh, there's three ways uh, you can give. Uh, you can give. Um, you can go to our website encnj.org. Just hit the giving icon. Uh, there should be a section on there. Whether you're giving your tithe, you can just uh, give it uh, normally. And then there also should be a place in the memo where you can give to our multiply uh, giving campaign. You can give via push pay uh, as well. You just text the the letters encnj to the number seven seven nine. Seven seven, uh, and also there's a way that you can uh, there uh, in the memo designate if it's to go to multiply or if it's a normal tithe and offering. And lastly, uh, you can mail in your tithe, your offering, your gift to 101 Gibraltar Drive, right here in Morris Plains, New Jersey. And God bless you as you give. And so, uh, and listen. And if this is your first time joining us, we don't want anything from you other than your heart to be open to receive a word from Almighty God. And that's where our message starts this morning. And so, uh, as always, I got to start with a, a story to kind of frame up where we're going. And we're in this Christmas season. 
And I remember a, a couple years back, um, there was a, a off-Broadway musical. It was, it was about the Christmas story. If you guys know the TV show with Ralphie and the Red Rider BB gun, and they, they have since uh, made a, a, the musical that was for uh, uh, the small screen. And so we went there, and, and here's how I wound up going there, is um, Justin Paul, uh, he wrote the musical score for A Christmas Story. You might also know him as a, uh, he, he won a, a Grammy, an Academy Award uh, for things like Dear Evan Hansen. Uh, he wrote the music for La La Land, uh, for The Greatest Showman, on and on we could go. If it, fe- if you fe- it feels like I'm name dropping right now, it's because I am. Uh, I, I married he and his wife, uh, Asher, and I just couldn't be more proud of the impact that, uh, that he's making. And so I did what every pastor would do that, that knew a, a famous artist. I asked him for free tickets to go see a Christmas story and he gave his pastor four free tickets. And so I, uh, I brought a few of my, uh, my friends with us. And so my, my wife and I and, and, uh, two friends. And do you guys ever notice this? Like when you have nostalgic, kind of romantic things in your head, it never is as cool as you imagine it to be. That's the situation. And so we, we get into our car and we're heading from New Jersey into Manhattan. And this is pre-COVID Manhattan when traffic is just a nightmare. And during the holiday season, the, the city just swells up um, with people. And, and so I remember we're just stuck in tunnel traffic forever. And then we're not even into the city yet. And it's been upwards of an hour and a half trip. And, and then I have to find parking. Um, I don't know if you ever tried to do this, but it's, it's close to impossible. And so we were going to be late for the showing. So I dropped uh, our two friends and my wife off um, at, at the, uh, the Broadway show house. And, and I told them, I'm going to try and find parking. Pray. And so I did what every Christian would do. God, please give me a parking spot. And, uh, and then if, the, if things didn't get any worse, uh, then suddenly I had to go to the bathroom. And so I'm like, oh, my goodness, now I'm kind of doing that thing. I don't know if that's too much information for a Sunday morning, but God bless you. Welcome to Every Nation, New Jersey. And so I want you to feel how urgent this was. And so uh, I pull into one or two um, par- parking lots that, uh, that you know, you could pay to get in. And sure enough, they said, no, we're full. And they made me keep searching. So this nightmare went on and on until finally uh, I had to pay. It, it felt like thousands of dollars. But at this point, I don't care. I just want to park my car, use the restroom, and get to the play. And so, uh, sure enough, I got into the parking spot. I, I entered into the Broadway Playhouse. And uh, as I did, the lights have already dimmed. And the play is about to begin. So it's extremely warm in there. So I took off my winter coat. And as I'm, I'm making, shuffling my way to the seats, my, my jacket got caught on, on one of the, uh, the chairs um, in the in the Broadway theater, and so I'm, I'm pulling on it, and it just wouldn't let go until finally I yanked it, and I realized that it wasn't stuck on a chair; it was stuck on a little girl's ponytail. And uh, so this look at this poor little girl. I've been tugging on this poor little girl's ponytail, and then her dad gets up, and he's just irate, you know. And and listen, for the record, uh, I would be too. Like I'm like, bro, you should punch me right now, you know, that type of thing. And so, oh, not a good start to the play, but the play goes on. It was a beautiful story, and here's the thing: the music was amazing, but there was they put a twist to it in the Broadway play as opposed to uh, the, the TV show that you'll watch Christmas morning, is um, the play ends with a twist. And we see Ralphie all grown up, and as he's reminiscing about the greatest Christmas gift he ever got was the, the, the uh, Red Rider BB gun. But it wasn't because the gun was so great. And here's the money line. He says it was because it was from my dad. And that's where we begin our story today. See, uh, Ralphie had this new perspective on who his father was, and it impacted everything uh, in his life. And so really, that's what I hope to do today, that I pray that you would get a new perspective on your heavenly father, and it would impact everything in your life. And so I only have two points this morning. That doesn't mean it's going to be fast, but uh, two points is this, is I want to talk to you about the God of joy and the joy of God. The God of joy and the joy of God. And so that's where we're headed here this morning. And so let's look at point number one is this, as I fix my, my notes that are blowing up here, is um, I want to talk to you about the joy of God. And so uh, I'm not sure how you grow up or uh, grew up or what your image or impression was of is of God, 
uh, for many of you, you have a picture of an angry old man with a beard. And he's just, he's just got a constant scowl and frown, uh, on his, on his, uh, face that, that God, he's, he just tolerates laughter and joy, right? And, and then if he sees you smiling, he's wondering why you're not praying more, right? And so if that's your vision of God, I would like to quote to you the words of Buddy the Elf. You sit on a throne of lies, all right? It's just not true. Listen, I want to prove to you in the Bible that our God is a God of joy. Like, do you know that there's joy in the Godhead, in the Trinity? Like, uh, the Christian faith believes that God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. And, and they're, they're, uh, indivisible, uh, but one. And so in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, there's this unique, euphoric love that, that they have. Theologians have given the Trinitarian love a name. They called it this, perichoresis. Perichoresis. Peri uh, means around. Choresis, it means to dance. To dance around. And so listen, if, if you're thinking that God was just some stoic, stagnant thing, no, our God is dancing around, uh, himself, the Father, around the Son, in the Spirit. And so I'm not sure if you're getting a picture of this in the, in the Spirit realm, but I mean, you got the Son out there and he's just, he's just kind of like cabbage patching up there. And then the Spirit's like, no, like, no, 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 we got to get the floss going, right? And so he's flossing, doing that thing. And the Father's kind of old school. And so he's trying to get the Macarena going. But the point is, man, the Godhead, there is a celebration of joy. And out of that joy, God creates everything. So, you know, did you know that there's joy in the creation story? Like, I know when we read Genesis 1, we all read it, in the beginning, God. Like, I always I hear in my head the voice of James Earl Jones, uh, you know, that, that he's God and he just says, light be, right? And light is. And all of that is true. This mighty thundering voice of God. He just speaks and creates everything there is. But did you know that that the book of Job, uh, it gives us a different perspective uh, on the creation narrative. It says in Job 38, 7, it says that the angels watched God create everything there is. And it says this, the angels shouted for joy. Like, is that a different perspective? I don't know if you've ever seen someone like an adult just shout for joy, like a fan at a sporting event or a fan at a concert and like just someone kind and they just, wow, they just kind of lose their mind. That's taking place in the heavenly realms that you get Gabriel and Michael and they watch God just thunder away and create things. And it says they shout for joy. They're like, no way that just happened. And Michael and Gabriel are high-fiving each other. Why? Because there's joy in the creation story. Um, how about this? The Apostle Paul, he's the greatest theological mind our faith has ever known. That uh, Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament epistles. That, that Paul is the one who went to the third heaven. I don't even know what that is, but Paul went there, okay? And here's what Paul, Paul describes Almighty God in 1 Timothy 1.11. He calls him the blessed God, or it can also be interpreted the happy God. Like that our God is happy, that there's a deep-seated fundamental joy that is the very essence of the God we serve. And so uh, um, there's another uh, a theologian. I don't know if you've heard of this one. Uh, He's from the early 1900s. His name is G.K. Chesterton. Uh, What a cool name, G.K. I mean, I get P.A., but uh, G.K. sounds pretty cool. And G.K. Chesterton, he says it's the fundamental posture of God is that of joy. And so he says it's so prevalent and predominant that God is able to rejoice in the mundane uh, and in the monotony of the day-to-day world. Like, um, have you ever noticed, uh, the joy of a child? Like, like a child, for the record, did you know that, that children smile 400 times a day? Do you know what adults smile on average? 40 times. Like somehow between that, uh, as we grow old, we lose 360 smiles. Not God. See, because God has the joy of a child and he can rejoice in the mundane. 
Like, did you ever see a kid, like a kid can watch the same movie over and over and over and he still is able to squeeze every last ounce of joy out of it again, again, again. And Chesterton, he says this, he says, how amazing is it that God can command the sun to rise and every day he says again, 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 that the stars and the moon uh, are to rise again and again, winter, fall, summer, spring, again, again, and again. God rejoices over it because our God is a God of joy. How about this? Did you know um, that there's joy in the Christmas story, the incarnation or the birth of Jesus Christ, that uh, uh, Luke gives us our most detailed account uh, of the Christmas narrative. And I'm not sure if you need to take some time to read Luke's account of the birth of Jesus Christ. Because when you read it, it reads like a Broadway musical, like high school musical or something, man. Because in Luke's account, everybody is singing for joy. Zechariah singing, Elizabeth is singing, Mary singing, Simeon singing, the angels are singing. Everybody is singing in the Christmas account. Why? Because their hearts are overflowing with joy, with joy. Because why? Because God's story and our God is a God of joy. How about King David, the most prolific songwriter in your Bible? He wrote uh, half of the Psalms. And do you know what David says in Psalm 16? He says this about God. In your presence is fullness of joy. Like in the presence of God, there is maximum joy. So I don't know if you've ever like... Uh, like gone into to Starbucks, and believe me, this coffee is not Starbucks this morning. Uh, but if you've ever gone into Starbucks, and they'll, they'll inevitably ask you this, um, would you like room for cream? Um, and I'm like, listen, bro, I'm paying like five bucks for this cup of coffee. I want you to fill that thing to the rim. I don't want no room for anything else. Like I want to spill it when I get it, okay? And, and David says, that's what God's like. Like God, when you're in God's presence, there's maximum joy. And then finally, the book of Galatians. Do you know in the book of Galatians that the Apostle Paul says this, that, that the fruit of the Holy Spirit's work in your life, it produces what? Joy. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, I'm not sure if I beat this horse sufficiently this morning, but I hope now you believe me when I say that our God is a God of joy. But um, maybe we can get that, but now it's going to lead us into a point number two is this. is. Uh, but I want to talk to you about the joy of God. Like, how do we access the joy of God in our own life? Remember, we said joy is this, uh, a deep and abiding soul satisfaction rooted in God. And so when, when happiness is nowhere to be found, that we can still walk in, we can access joy. Let me demonstrate this in the scriptures. Uh, Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 40. I, I want to read to you, the disciples have been arrested um, uh, by the Pharisees and Sadducees because they've been proclaiming Jesus. And they tell them they're not to proclaim the name of Jesus anymore. They refuse. And so uh, I, I want you to read what happens now. Acts chapter 5, verse 40, it says this. And when they had called the apostles, they beat them and charge them not to speak in the name of Jesus. So I need to add some context. I need you to feel this with me. We just read it and it says, oh, and they beat them. What probably happened is, is the apostles were, were beaten with 39 lashes. And so they would, they would, they would, they would hoist them up, uh, tie their arms together, and then they would take a whip and they would hit them twice on the back. They would flip them and, and hit them once on the front, flip them again, and they would do that 13 times twice on the back once on the front and so do you feel the pain of that the humiliation of that and then in verse 41 here's what it says then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name <laughs> did you get that i mean they were beaten with 39 lashes and it says they they left rejoicing listen i know those apostles they had marks on them but I know for sure that, that their rejoicing left a mark on that council, on those Pharisees and those Sadducees. And so somehow, through all that pain, they were able to access joy. 
And so how do we access the joy of God? I'm glad you asked because that's what I want to talk to you about. Uh, John chapter 16, verse 24. John says this, uh, uh, Jesus says this, until now, you have asked nothing in my name. If you have your Bible, underline this. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And so uh, I'm going to do something for the first time. I've never done this in every nation, New Jersey history. I swore I never would, but I'm actually going to do this. I'm actually going to use an acronym today. All right. Forgive me. Believe me, I hate myself for doing it. But uh, but Jesus says that that we can ask. And that's going to be my, my acronym for us today. How do we access the joy of God? We ask. A, we abide. S, we seek. And K, we know. We ask, we seek, and we know. Or excuse me, we abide, we seek, and we know. Uh, let's look at this. Number one, we abide. We abide. Um, John chapter 15, verse 11. Uh, let me give you just kind of uh, the context of John 15. That, uh, that Jesus is writing, uh, and, and Jesus is speaking, and he's going to say this, you are to abide in me, abide, abide, abide. He uses the word abide ten times in seven verses, all right? That's a lot of abiding. Abide in me, he says, abide in my love, abide in my word, and so it's abide, abide, abide. Uh, and then let me just, uh, now he's going to give us the payoff for all that abiding. John 15, 11, he says, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So I, the first reminder is this, man, when you, you're struggling to access joy where happiness is nowhere to be found, what do we need to do? We need to abide in Jesus. Uh, if you remember the, uh, Joseph's story, that Joseph and Mary, they had young Jesus as a young boy. They, they went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And then as they were heading back home to Nazareth uh, from Jerusalem, do you remember what happened? They got a day's journey and they realized, uh-oh, we forgot Jesus. Um, Mary, I'm, I'm just assuming she's looking at, how could you lose your son? And Mary's probably losing her mind. Uh, and so they go back into Jerusalem and they find Jesus. But uh, my, my point is this, and for the record, do you know that after that moment that we never hear from Joseph again? So I don't know if Mary did something to him or whatever, but I'm just saying, okay? But uh, I, I reference that story to say this. Sometimes we get caught up in our life and we forget to bring Jesus with us, to abide in Jesus. Do you know that uh, in the book of Nehemiah, there's a, there's a passage of scripture I'm, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that Nehemiah is going to say this, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Um, do you know that that, that word for that, that is interpreted strength, uh, it's interpreted several times in your Old Testament. That's the only time it's, it's used, it's interpreted as strength. Every other time it's this, the joy of the Lord is your refuge. It's interpreted as the word refuge, fortress, stronghold, and so what he's saying is, is that joy, it becomes this refuge, this stronghold, this place when our world is falling apart around us, that we can find refuge, what? Abiding in Jesus. And so, listen, if your world's unraveling this morning, I want you to run for cover, to abide in Jesus. Because if you tap into Jesus, you'll tap in to joy. Did you know that even the word enthusiasm, have you ever thought about this? Like uh, N means in and theo, theos means God. Uh, enthusiasm is about being in God or in Jesus. And so I don't know if you, that's been your picture of Jesus, that when you tap into him, you tap into joy. Like uh, just, uh, do you remember Jesus' very first miracle? Do you remember where he was? He was at a wedding feast. I mean, they used to do up those feasts. They would, they would have a wedding party for up to a week. And so as this, this feast is taking place, they run out of wine. And Mary looks to her son, Jesus, God in the flesh. And she says, Jesus, you need to handle this. And what does he do? He turns water into wine. In other words, Jesus, he keeps the celebration going. Because when you tap into Jesus, you tap into joy. Um, probably in about, in about 23 days from now, uh, many of you are going to experience what we just call, psychologists call, 
uh, the Christmas blues. <laughs> you know what that's like? December 26th, and you're just like, man, the Christmas lights, they've lost their sparkle. You know, all the presents are gone from under the tree, and you experience the Christmas blues. But uh, do you know when you tap into Jesus, that's not necessary. Like uh, when, when we meet Jesus in the Gospel of John, Jesus is celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you don't know what this is, that they would have these enormous candle operas that, um, uh, with these, that they would light up Jerusalem at, at night. And so the, the city would be, a, it would be a week long festival celebrating Jesus' faithfulness in the wilderness. And so it'd be this epic party going on. But then at the end of the seventh or eighth day, suddenly the, the torches, the candles would go down and Jerusalem would grow dark. And it's in that moment that Jesus speaks in John chapter 8. He says this, me, I am the light of the world. In other words, Jesus is like, listen, the party never has to end with Jesus, but he will be our lasting light. And so, um, listen, uh, the Christmas celebration, like what we're celebrating when we celebrate Christian, Christmas is the incarnation of Jesus Christ, God becoming a man. And here's what we know now. The God of joy would become a man of sorrows. Why? It's so he could experience what it was like, the, the pain of living in a broken humanity, and he could be a faithful and a sympathetic high priest. But you also need to know this. It was not just so he could feel what we feel, but he could actually exchange what we feel. See, I, I love this saying. It was, it's this, that the Son of God became a man so that men might become sons of God. Like, did you catch that? Like, there's this great exchange with Jesus. In fact, he, he promises us this in Isaiah 61. He says, um, let me give you the oil of joy in exchange for mourning. Like, like, uh, during great festivals and feasts, that, that those that are celebrating at the party, they would be, they'd be anointed with oil. And Jesus says, let me take your mourning and let me give you the oil of joy and of gladness. Cause that's what God is. And we had, uh, we access, uh, joy by what? By abiding. Here's number two is this. We, we access what? By S, by seeking. We seek for joy and beauty that's all around us. And so, uh, Philippians four. Uh, in Philipp, the book of Philippians, we know this, that joy is a mega theme. That Paul uses the word joy 16 times, and there's only four chapters uh, in the book. And so this mega theme of joy. And here's what Paul has the ability to do. That he can seek and find beauty, joy, uh, love in the darkest of places. Did you know that that Paul is writing uh, the book of Philippians from jail, from prison. In fact, there's people that are, that are saying false things, uh, uh, about Paul and what he said about Jesus. And as they're doing that, as he's in prison, he's making it worse for that, uh, him in the prison. As they talk about him, they're piling on his legal woes in that point. But what does Paul do? He doesn't bemoan that. What he does is he says this, well, he says, nevertheless, Christ is preached. <laughs> he says, listen, they may be talking about me, but at least they're talking about Jesus too. That, uh, that we'd find out this as he's sitting in jail. He doesn't know, am I going to be executed or am I going to get set free? And, and what, what does he do in this darkness? What does he say? He says, well, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Like somehow, some way he's able to fix his focus on joy. And that is the art of rejoicing. And so let me read to you Philippians 4, verse 4. Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I will say rejoice. And so, so what he's saying is to, to, to seek out uh, the thousands of, of little tokens of joy, of, of beauty, of love that are all around you. So um, I'll, I'll illustrate this way. Is, so in, in my home, like during the Christmas season, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, presents are a big deal. <laughs> Like, uh, uh, gifts are my daughter and my, my wife's love language. And so presents are a big deal. In fact, uh, I think it was last year, my daughter, she showed me this, uh, t-shirt she wanted to get. And, and on it, it said this, that, that presents speak louder than words. 
<laughs> so I gotta, I gotta love that. And, and I'm sure, I, listen, if gifts is your love language, you can just type in amen to that. All right. But, uh, but here's something that got me. Both my daughters, Cassie and Elizabeth, when they, when they were little kids, it, they had like this supernatural gift to be able to find the Christmas presents that we had hidden for them in the house. And so I don't know how they did it, but every year they seemed to find it. I remember one year we were in Manhattan, and my wife and I, we went out to walk the dogs to, to go to the, the bathroom, and we weren't gone but for 15 minutes, and we came back up to our apartment, and, and we were locked out. And it wasn't because the kids were afraid of strangers. It was because they wanted to lock us out because they were back finding and looking for all their Christmas presents, right? And so um, on the rare occasion, when we're able to hide them from them, and, and then we, we put them under the tree, my oldest daughter, she had like, she became like this clairvoyant or, or savant, like where she could just pick up a present, she could just shake it, and she'd go, yeah, it's a Barbie. Mm, yeah, this is a blouse. Jeans, my little pony. Right. And so she just, she like would guess and get, get all the stuff. And she had this, this gift to be able to, to spot. Oh, uh, all the gifts that were hidden in plain sight for them. And you know that that's what Paul means when he tells us to rejoice, that we're to look for, ask God to give us eyes to see his gifts that are hidden in plain sight. Did you know that the, the scriptures are going to say this, that every good and every perfect gift is from above? from the Father of lights, like anything good in your life is from the Lord. That, uh, that he would, uh, I heard uh, one theologian say it this way, that, that generosity, it's woven in to the very fabric of God's creation. So in other words, like uh, on average, you're gonna take 20,000 breaths a day. <sighs> you're welcome. That's God's gift to you. That, uh, do you know that God gives, I'm, I'm imagining most of you have eaten today. And you know that food, that's God's gift to you. The fact that it tastes, what a glorious gift uh, from God. Um, we could go on and on. Every moment where you see beauty in God's creation, you're welcome. It's a gift from Him. And we need to rejoice, uh, even in the darkest of moments. Like, if we think of Paul's life, like, uh, they tell Paul, Paul, we're going to kill you. And what does Paul say? Well, to die is gain. <laughs> he, they say this, Paul, we're going to lock you in prison. And what's Paul's response? Well, good. I need a time to write. And he writes two thirds of the New Testament that they're going to say, Paul, we're going to chain you to a Praetorian guard, a Roman soldier. And he's like, this is amazing. I have a captive audience. I, I'm going to win Caesar's uh, army to Christ. Right. And so see that he just was able to find joy or to rejoice always in everywhere. And so I need you right, to seek. Where, like if happiness is nowhere to be found, you need to ask God for eyes to see all that's good and right in your life. Seek it out. And then lastly, uh, remember, so it's abide, seek. And now lastly, know. Like there's some uh, knowledge. See, do you have a knowledge of God's word? I'm going to uh, read to you James chapter 1. Verses two through four. And if you're, if you know that, that the author of the book of James was actually Jesus's brother, James. And so, uh, James is kind of going to know what he's talking about here, but what he's going to say, it sounds crazy or absurd, uh, but it's unbelievably powerful. Let me read to you James chapter one, uh, starting in verse two. James says this, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. What? What is James talking about? He says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so I, I hope you saw that. Like he says to give thanks in every trial, difficult situation in your life, um, not for the difficulty or the trial, but rather, he says, because you know something, because you know that God has allowed you to walk through this. Why? Because he wants to produce something in our life. God, the good God, the God of joy, wants to produce something eternal and lasting in our life. And so here's what I know. I know some of you are going through trials right now because God is weaving and fashioning inside of you wisdom. Um, wisdom is the ability to navigate life well. So I was, I was watching. I'm, I'm not proud of this. Men, uh, 
I may have to give up my, my man card, but uh, I watched a Taylor Swift documentary with, with my daughter this past week. Get off me, all right? And I was spending time with my baby girl. And so we were watching this Taylor Swift documentary, and apparently she dropped an album uh, while we were all quarantined in COVID. And she was explaining uh, the, the uh, one song that was, I believe it was titled called Mirror Ball. And she started saying this about how a mirror ball, you know, that thing you dance around at the disco, is it's, it's hundreds of shattered pieces of mirrors that, that is, that's put together and suddenly it becomes radiant and people gather around it. And so many times God takes the shard pieces of our life, the difficulties, and as he begins to piece them and put them back together, he's able to create wisdom and beauty through it. And people will gather around you to hear the wisdom of what you've walked through, right? And so, so God is weaving a wi- uh, wisdom inside of many of you through trials and difficulty. Do you know this? That for some of you, I know this, that your trial or difficulty you're walking through right now, God is fashioning strength on the inside of you. That uh, there's a steadfastness, a steeliness. And so I know many of you will remember uh, uh, September 11th, 2001, Listen, if, if you're 30 years or older, you'll know where you were. You can just recall it exactly when you heard the news um, that terrorists had flown a, a plane into the Twin Towers in Manhattan. And then by the time the second tower fell and there was just, uh, and, the, and the smoke and the dust settled, like when you went and saw the, the devastation and the destruction, there were just these jagged, uh, bent, burnt pieces of metal. But I don't know if you've heard this. Do you know that that metal was taken and, and it was, it was melted down and it was refined until suddenly, uh, what they did is they built from that, the, from the rubble and destruction of 9-11 that they took that steel and they built a battleship, the USS New York. I believe we have a picture of it. And so God, in the same way, is able to take every tear, every sorrow, every difficulty, and he's fashioning something on the inside of you, a strength and a steadfastness that God is going to use for good and to set people free. Listen, we might not like the process, uh, but we will like what it produces. Last story. So since the, uh, the, 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 uh, the COVID, you know, how um, my gym had shut down. And so, uh, I, I met a, a friend in our, in our neighborhood. His name is, uh, Craig Parcells. What's up, big Craig? And, uh, uh, Craig and I, we will, uh, I'll go to his house. He has a home gym. We meet at an ungodly time, like about 5.30 a.m. And, and we, we work out spiritually and physically. We go through one book, uh, of the gospels together. And then we, we get our soul on. We start working out together. And um, he, Craig has, as I walk into his home gym, he has this giant whiteboard. Uh, I believe we'll have an image of it. And uh, it, it's just the goal board. Okay? I call it the hell board or the torture board. Uh, because every morning when I come in, there's going to be a workout written out on it. And most mornings I come in and I'm like, oh no, I don't want to do that. Some mornings I'll get in and I'll be like, I think I can make that. I can do that. And then, but, uh, but most are like, Oh no, this is going to hurt really, really bad. But see, there's, there's something that gets me through every workout. Uh, number one is I know that it's producing something inside of me and we're hoping it's producing six pack abs. Okay. Um, and not only that, but I know, you know what? That someone's going through it with me. You know that God says he'll never leave you, never forsake you, that Jesus walks through it with you. And then thirdly, you know, when I'm finished with the workout and I'm in my car and I'm just sweaty and exhausted, I just can't begin to describe the deep sense of soul satisfaction, of, of joy, of knowing that, that I had poured it all out. And do you know, um, in Hebrews chapter 12, that the, the author of Hebrews, he says this, it says, Jesus, who for what? The joy set before him endured the cross. He despised the shame. He hated going through it. But for the joy set before him, he endured it. And so, um, listen, I got to I got to land the plane here. And so uh, I want to close just reminding you if that, that we serve a God 
of joy. And we can access the supernatural strength of joy. And remember the three ways we do it. You, you need to abide, seek, and know that as you, as you ask God, that I promise you, you're going to be able to access joy. Hey, uh, let me pray for you. Father, I just thank you this morning, God, for everyone, uh, Lord, uh, with an earshot of this broadcast. And Lord, I'm praying for those that just where happiness is nowhere to be found. Father, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit and our faithfulness to ask, abide, seek, and know, Lord, that we would access, Lord, a deep soul satisfaction rooted in you. We would access joy in Jesus' name. Hey, Merry Christmas, every nation. And um, quick reminder uh, before we sign off, uh, number one is this. I want to remind you that if you need prayer for anything, we have a virtual prayer counselor that will meet with you uh, immediately following our, our broadcast at 11 a.m. at 11 a.m. sharp on our Facebook Live. We will have a, a virtual prayer counselor to meet with you. Or if you would like to speak to a pastor, maybe you're new and would like to talk to a pastor, we have what's called virtual hospitality. Uh, that uh, as the credits roll at the end of our service today, you'll see a slide with a Zoom video conference call number. You just need to, uh, you can call that number and there'll be a pastor waiting there at 11 a.m. Uh, to meet, speak with you, pray with you. Uh, and then lastly, this, uh, I would, you know that we're not only just doing this online, but we meet locally here in Morris Plains, New Jersey. And so I would love to see you one Sunday morning. And so if you'd like to join us live and in person, uh, just go to our, our website and you can register online uh, to come attend one of our services. Would love to see you. And listen, every nation, God loves you. And I think you're pretty great too. Have a great week. Yeah.